A nation can survive its fools, and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. about the wars, they've been wrong about jobs, they've been wrong about everything. The question is, are they stupid or do they have a plan? I actually think for the most part, they have a plan, but some are not too smart. Welcome to the Horrible Deplorable Show, the anti-globalist America First program dedicated to de-hoaxing the media and destroying the narrative. Here's your host, the founder and editor of The Daily Stir, Matt Wingard. Hello, everyone. It's Matt Wingard again with my friend Doris, and I am the Horrible Deplorable. Welcome to our second show. Welcome to all gabbers. We appreciate you listening to us. This show is done especially for you. Uh, we're still trying to do these once a week, and... Um, we are. Uh, you can find us on SoundCloud, and you can also find us on Stritcher. Uh, so I would uh, hope that uh, if you uh, listen to us on either one of those, that you would review us and uh, share us on your social feeds if you like the show. We want to grow our audience. Hello, Doris. Hello, Matt. Okay, so uh, it was a heck of a week. It's always a heck of a week with President Trump because... He has all the elites against him, and we're going to talk about that. But let's um, let's start with two things that are the most recent in the news. Uh, the UK had their elections, and the Conservatives lost 12 seats. It turns out it wasn't a particularly good idea for, ter- for Theresa May to call a snap election. I think now we can see that the other side is very energized by the president's tweets, by all that he's accomplishing, you know, from the executive office with with very little help from Republicans in Congress. And that has a lot of people on the left alarmed and highly motivated, and they came out in force, especially uh, younger people who tend to be far more liberal. Um, and that hurt the conservatives. But they will be able to form a government, it looks like, with the uh, very socially conservative UDP party in uh, Northern Ireland. Um, they only needed, um, let's see, they lost six, but the UDP has like nine. So that's enough to put them back into a controlling majority. Um, so Brexit probably goes forward, but uh, it's in, you know it's injured. The whole idea is injured because the other side pushed back. And it just goes to show that everybody's got to work real hard and at election time and show up and not take anything for granted. Bad things happen when you take it for granted. Yeah. Um, I said in the last podcast that, um, that, you know, it's not over when Trump's eight years are done as president, you know. This Sierra Club used to have a motto, I think they still do, that uh, it's constant pressure constantly applied. And this is a motto for the left, and it's why they've gained what they've gained. You know, that. remember my analogy from last week about the robber who takes half and comes back around the corner for another slice. That's the way liberals are, constantly pushing, taking whatever they can get at this time, and they'll be back tomorrow. Um it is kind of a religion for him, but you have to be ready to engage in that fight. And as I said last week, if it's if it bothers you that it's uncomfortable or that the fight is hard, you better get out and step aside and let other people do it because the left's not afraid of mixing it up. They're not afraid of harsh words. They're, they're not afraid of going low. I mean, that's sort of how they've gotten everything they've gotten. And that's the reality. So... It looks like the Conservatives will limp along in the UK towards Brexit, but uh, a lot of self-inflicted wounds that they're going to have to deal with. Now, we'll see whether Theresa May survives uh, as Prime Minister. If she doesn't, she'll be the shortest serving Prime Minister in UK, recent UK history. Okay, the other element of news was the Comey testimony this week. And what did we learn from the Comey testimony? We learned that he had told the president three times that the president was not being investigated and that the president asked him repeatedly to say that in public. 
Was he talking out of both sides of his mouth? Absolutely. And uh, I think that alone is a reason for the president to fire him. You know, it's not CYA or protection or, or any sense of uh, unfairness to ask the director of the FBI to, to say in public what he's telling you in private. It's the, you know... Nothing's classified if the president doesn't want it to be classified. So if the FBI director tells him something in private and the president says, I'd like the public to know that, it's the director's job to go out and tell the public the same thing that he just told the president. He's, he works for him. And this had nothing to do with subverting justice or anything like that. He just wanted the FBI director to say in public what he had said in private. That's ridiculous. The other thing we learned was that uh, he has a double standard, and this guy Comey, who everyone in DC in the DC swamp says has just got impeccable integrity, he has very little integrity, and it's all BS. Not only is he a leaker, we'll get to that in a second, but when Loretta Lynch asked him to call the Clinton investigation a matter, not an investigation, he agreed to do that, saying it wasn't a hill worth dying on. So she actually was being investigated, and he acquiesced to not saying that in public even though it was true the president was not being and is not being investigated and he wouldn't come forward and say that yeah he's a poor excuse for a government employee well if it's possible to set the ball lower so he admitted also in the hearing that he had leaked now he tried to claim that it was in response to trump's tweet about um, he, you know, Comey better worry that there aren't tapes in the White House. But it turns out the timeline's wrong on that. The New York Times did a story the day before Trump's tweet talking about the Comey memo and the single source that read it out to him, which fits perfectly with Comey's story of having leaked this to a friend of his at a university who then shared it with a reporter. The next day, Trump tweets that you know, uh, Comey better worry that there aren't actual recording devices. So Comey goes in and testifies this week that, no, it was in response to that tweet that I leaked. Bull. So the timeline has caught him in his lie. And I think one of the things we've learned from his story is, is that this is probably not the first time he's leaked. I mean, this was a very, he knew exactly how to do it and went about it very efficiently. Oh, I don't know how you can say that. Let's hope the sarcasm, uh, penetrates through the microphone on that i you know i uh, there's been some reporting out there that you know comey and his team are this are the possible source of some leaks and i think that's been pretty well verified to the extent that you can get things verified in dc uh you know if you read his memo um, or his statement, I'm sorry, his statement to the Congress, and he, the way he narrates and tells that story, it's clear that he was constantly in consultation with his team, meaning the senior members of the FBI leadership, and asking for their advice. And I suspect that he, wink, wink, you know, nudge, nudge, relied on them to do some of the leaking for him at various times. He also made it clear that he was trying to force the special counsel by what he was doing? Think about that. Think about that. The man was obviously trying to undermine the President of the United States, who he told in private was not the subject of an investigation. So that means it was for political reasons. It's all part of that never Trump DC swamp. They cannot stand, oh, the humanity that this ogre has been allowed to become President of the United States, and they're trying to do everything they can to undermine him. So I had said in on my Gab feed and on Twitter that when the Mueller special uh, you know special counsel was um, announced that that was a serious turn of events. This is something that the McCain types had been drum beating for for months. It's part of the step-by-step -step process of trying to undermine the President of the United States. Be very clear that Mueller has wide latitude to go wherever he wants. Just like the Valerie Plame uh, investigation eventually led to a perjury charge against the vice president's chief of staff that had nothing to do with Valerie Plame, and the Whitewater investigation that Kenneth Starr, you know, unleashed or was put at the head of, you know, eventually led to charges against the president related to, you know, what he was doing with Monica Lewinsky. 
Mueller has wide latitude to go anywhere, and I wouldn't be surprised at all to see the investigation spiral. Um, I, there was some mention the other day about how he's going to wrap it up in three months. Well, let's see. Let's see if he actually wraps it up in three months, because I have very little confidence. When has his special investigation only taken three months? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I, I, I am... I'm unhappy with that turn of events. I blame the Republican Party and never Trump Republicans in Congress for that entirely. I think it's what they wanted. And uh, I'm very worried that that becomes an excuse to just accelerate the witch hunt. But time will tell. Shortly after Comey's testimony, uh, Trump's lawyer, who's just a bulldog, uh, came out and, and indicated that he believed that Comey had violated the law with those leaks. And I saw this morning that he is uh, indicated he's going to file an ethics complaint against Comey uh, for that. And I think he should. I mean, I, I, you know, it turns out Comey's not very good at testifying. This is probably why he avoids it, because he cannot apparently walk in the FBI had to correct part of his testimony this morning. He cannot walk into Congress and testify without lying or misstating the truth. And it has to be, this is the second time in a row he's testified in front of Congress. And within 24 hours, the FBI or the Justice Department has had to issue a statement correcting his testimony. That's pretty pathetic. And this is the director of the FBI, the man with all the integrity, you know, right? I mean, and he can't testify at, in Congress and tell the whole truth the truth and nothing but the truth? Well, when you're not telling the whole truth, it gets very sticky not to trip yourself up. Yeah, keeping the lies straight, right? So last week I mentioned something that I want to expand upon a little bit, and that is I said that in the election we had a, an unusual event that has never happened in the history of this country, in my opinion. And I think that if I actually went down and went through all the elections, I could back up my claim. But never before in American history have 90% or more of the elites who essentially are in control in this country, have they all been on one side of an election. And by one side, I mean that they were divided among those who were actively supporting Hillary and those who just maybe normally would have been supporting the Republican, but they didn't like Donald Trump, they didn't believe in Donald Trump, and they were secretly hoping and assuming that he was going to lose. Those folks may have publicly endorsed him, but that doesn't matter. Some of them had to do that because they're public officials and they needed to look unified for the party once he'd won the nomination. But my contention is the vast majority of elites were either openly opposed to Trump or secretly just waiting for him to lose in November so that they could go through our, their I told you so's and the you know, recriminations. And basically, many of them had actually said they were, they were keeping lists of all the pro-Trump people, and they were going to run them down one by one for, you know, the equivalent of a public execution politically uh, after the election. No wonder they were all so shocked when he won. Oh, absolutely. I think very few people... Look, none, no one on the other side thought he was going to win, but I think a lot of... Um, I think some actual Trump supporters were surprised, but I think most of the people that were surprised on the non-Hillary side were people who had never really been invested in Trump, didn't believe he was going to win, didn't want him to win, and were actually shocked when he did on election night. A lot of people were just going through the motions. I think Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell were just going through the motions of being good soldiers and, and you know endorsing the nominee of the party and just waiting for him to lose so that they could move on. Um, and of course, because he because they'd covered their asses, they didn't have to admit that that's what they were doing. Once he won, they could claim, well, I always believed in him, everything was good, you know, and they could move on, but they weren't. So my point in bringing this all up again is, you know, when that's, a, that's a, first of all, that's a, an, an incredible historical achievement to have 90% of the elites, the power structure in a country opposing you and you still win is phenomenal. But it also means that your win is never really secure. If in previous elections we've noticed that even Al Gore eventually endorsed George Bush and went away for a while to let him be president of the United States, this sort of peaceful transition of power, well, folks, it didn't happen. Believe it or not, this was the first time in American history in which there was not a peaceful transition of power. A lot of us may have thought that that's what happened. It did not happen. 
the never Trump Republicans and the left side, the you know the entire left in this country, immediately went into full war mode against the president. What do you think the hashtag "Not My President" is all about? That is a, a, a refusal to acknowledge that the election occurred, to acknowledge the election results, and to acknowledge Donald Trump as the rightful president, duly elected president of the United States. Not only uh, were they against Trump, but they're against the people's revolution, which is what really elected him. Sure, of course. I mean, this has always been sort of partly about Trump's personality and partly about the things that he actually advocates, the trade changes that he wants, the immigration changes that he campaigned on. These are things that, you know, people genuinely oppose in the power structure, and they are undermining him. So... I bring this up again to make the point that there is a war going on against the president that never stopped. It was happening during the campaign, and when they were shocked to see that he actually won, they just continued on. And the constant drumbeat, the Russia hoaxing stuff is all about, you know, best case scenario is to get him impeached or get him out. Middle case scenario is to neutralize him so that he can't get anything done or to give cover to Republicans for not passing his agenda. Best case scenario, uh, worst case scenario is is that they just simply damage the president and the Republicans enough with this constant drumbeat that they can pick up seats and try to win back one of the houses in 2018. But it is a full court press against the president constantly. And it's coming from the DC press, it's coming from DC politicians, from lobbyists, from the staff members for DC politicians, it's coming from all the agency employees, the bureaucrats, you know, we talk about draining the swamp, the president talks about draining the swamp, but there's really only so much that can be done. Senior leadership in the agencies can be replaced and should be, and they're not moving fast enough on that, but you can't just wholesale fire the entire staff of the EPA or the housing department. A lot of these folks are federal employees and they have union protections. So, you know, there, you just have to understand that the, the sort of rank and file in most of these agencies is adamantly opposed to the president. And this, you know, the think tanks, all the various associations, you know, the lobbyists and all of the different interest groups belong to us. So there's a hospitals association, you know, there's a broad insurance companies association. The unions have an association, the AFL-CIO. I mean, everyone who lobbies in D.C. usually belongs to some kind of overarching association. Now, many of the associations that we would think of as on our side in the past are not. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a great example. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is absolutely dedicated to uh, open borders and the free trade agreements that we have now. You know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce represents some of the country's largest corporations. You know, the NFIB is a little... You know, is known more for representing the small businesses in this uh, country. But the, the chamber represents the large, the big ones. You know, the Googles, the Pepsis, the Cokes, the McDonald's of the world, uh, the Boeings. And as we've talked about before, the, you know, the major corporations in this country and in this world are not capitalists. You know, they give you a lot of platitudes about that, but... You know, they're so big and so large that they run quasi-monopolies to some extent or another, and they are not opposed to excessive regulation because it creates an enormous barrier to entry. You know, if you're an oil company and they're going to pass a bunch of regulations against oil that makes it, you know, that it makes it so that it costs a billion dollars more to drill a new well in the Gulf or something like that, if you're Exxon or BP, you love that. Because you're a multi-billion dollar corporation. You can afford to spend that billion dollars, and it means there won't be any little guys coming to drill. You know, and no up-and-comers are going to be able to come up with that kind of money. And you know, most of the large corporations have huge compliance uh, uh, departments, hundreds if not thousands of people, and they're ready to handle all of that. Now, in a, you know, they may in public say that they oppose things, and they may sit in committees and attempt to oppose them to try to get modest changes. A lot of times they're looking for some kind of favorable treatment. They end up with something in the bill that actually helps them in the midst of all that regulation. But the idea that major corporations represented by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce are going to fight for the kind of nationalist agenda or even support the kind of nationalist agenda that Trump was running on, 
is a joke. I mean, it's just, it's a pipe dream. It's never going to happen. Most of them are, mul they're all multinational corporations anyway, so their interest in nationalism is about zero. And they're run by people who are elitists in every sense of the word, you know, flying on private jets, flying first class, vacationing all over the world. The idea that, you know, that they have any interest in national borders in the way that a blue collar worker in the United States would be very interested in having borders maintained so that we aren't flooding the country with low income labor uh, and that we aren't, you know, sending manufacturing jobs overseas. That just means something different to a guy in Indiana than it does to the, you know, senior leadership of McDonald's. They're just two different worldviews. And we got to know that there's just very few people, very, very few people in the in what I would consider the broad D.C. swamp who have any interest in what Trump is advocating for. Well, the, the worst is that he's advocating for change. And that's very scary to people who've been in their position for years. Absolutely true. So the 2018 congressional elections um, are the next up for us. We are 25, almost 25% of the way there. At the end of June, Republicans will have used up 25% of their time before the next election. What have they actually passed? The House has passed a repeal and replace uh, bill, and they've passed a Dodd-Frank bill, but the Senate hasn't moved on anything yet. There's been no movement on the tax reform that Trump has talked about, no movement on the infrastructure bill that Trump talked about. We'll see, you know, and we'll check back in at the 50% uh, mark in six more months, but they are rapidly running out of time to get all of these things done. The budget's got to be done this year, too, and the president's asking for significant cuts. Now, I suspect it's an art of the deal situation. I mean, the kinds of cuts that he's asking for are not only unprecedented, they're un unprecedented times 10. And, you know, I suspect that, you know, he's asking for 70% or 30% or 15% cuts. And at the end of the day, if he gets 5 or 10% in actual cuts from these departments, those would still be the most significant cuts that have ever taken place. And I, I, I suspect that by going big with these cuts and asks, he's sort of forcing the Republicans to come to the table with something in the way of cuts when they when they move on these budgets but we are going to keep track of it and we're going to watch it and we're going to name names we're going to name names on the appropriations committees the chairmen of each and every one of these the sub chairmen of each and every one of these committee budgets and who what the president asked for in cuts and what they actually delivered these are your republicans you know the republicans that we supported the republicans who've been telling us for years they believe in smaller government will they actually pass budgets that do that. Let's see. Let's see. We'll know a lot by October or November. Some really big news this uh, week. You know, this uh, Jeff Sessions announced that the DOJ is going to stop the extortion of corporations that uh, has been going on under the Obama administration. So how this works is the DOJ will just sue some corporation for running afoul, some business for running afoul of the you know, billions of regulations that are out there that it's probably impossible not to run afoul of in some way or another. And what they'll do is they'll offer them a easy way out. We'll offer you a quick settlement on this if you will write a check to a nonprofit. And who are those nonprofits? That money was going to Planned Parenthood, you know, environmental groups, folks like that. So essentially, it was a way to extort money from corporations who normally wouldn't want to give money to left-leaning organizations and, and force them to write a check to get out from a prosecution to the tune of millions of dollars. This, by the way, this, this was ended by Sessions, so hoorah to him for that. But let's, let's talk for a minute about something that I've said for years, which is that if you're, if you're on the right side of uh, politics in this country, you pay for 100% of the fight from our side. But you also pay 75% of the fight for your opponents. How does that work? Right. So how do we end up funding two-thirds or three-fourths of most of, of the other side? So in other words, we pay for the fight on the other side against us, right? How does that end up happening? Well, through a number of different ways. One is is that, I'll give you just an example. There are a number of environmental groups that are out there opposed to logging, opposed to grazing out here in the West, and they will sue the U.S. Forest Service when they go out to do a bid on, on 
you know, tree cut, or they'll sue when the BLM will put out contracts for grazing or mining or anything else. And the way the federal law is structured, and it was Democrats that got this uh, in the law, is that if you sue and you win on any point, then you're allowed to ask for attorney's fees, right? So the tactic that a lot of these environmental organizations will use is that they may, you know, sue under a whole bunch of things. They'll list like a hundred things. This wasn't done right. That wasn't done right. They didn't date it right. It wasn't signed by the right person or they, they missed a deadline by one day. You know, they'll list like a hundred things that are wrong with, with whatever the U.S. Forest Service has done. Now, the U.S. Forest Service may under a Republican president, uh, fight it, and they may go into court and prove that it's not true. 99 out of the 100 things are not true. Oh, but this one thing is true. We did make an error on page 8. That, so that one thing on their 100 list is correct, but we they're wrong on everything else. Guess what? Under the law, they win attorney's fees because they were right on one thing, right? So the whole tactic is to get the attorney's fees because at the end of the day, then, it's cost the environmental group nothing. And if they've kind of goose the attorney's fees, then they've actually made money on the suit, which funds their organization. They get that and grants. By the way, under a Democrat administration, oftentimes the U.S. Forest Service or the BLM leadership will simply settle. So they'll read the lawsuit and they'll say, yeah, you know, you're right, and you should get attorney's fees because they secretly like all those organizations and they want them to get the money. So millions of dollars flows out of the federal treasury to these organizations who sue because the law allows them to collect for attorney's fees. Another example is the billions of dollars that are given out in grants from all of these, you know, HUD, um, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, EPA, they all give out millions and millions of dollars in grants. It is mostly left-leaning organizations like the Sierra Club, like um, Planned Parenthood, like, um, you know, we know, we would have to list dozens and dozens. Just think of any left-leaning organization, you know, a housing, a local housing authority or a, or a, a food bank. You think of all these uh, nonprofits, and by the way, they go out of their way to try to deny religious charities, which would tend to be staffed by people who are more right-leaning, although... There, is, there are some grants that are given out. I don't want to say that that never happens. But the bulk, the bulk of these grants end up in the hands of left-leaning organizations, right? So do they, you know, some of them provide a service, and that's great. But a lot of them are doing advocacy or research, you know. I mean, the Sierra Club's not doing anything. You know, they may be doing what they claim is like land reclamation or they're saving something. But that's also another boondoggle where they end up turning that over to the federal government to get it off of their rolls. Point being that when these billions of dollars of grants are awarded to all these organizations, that becomes part of their budget. And, you know, a $10 million uh, grant to some organization means, you know, that means 20, 25 people probably are employed. Add that up and it's thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who are ultimately employed because these grants are awarded. Who are those people? They're an army of leftists. They're an army of of available activists. You know, when the left decides it wants to do a protest and suddenly you see thousands of people to protest, a lot of those people work for these organizations and they take the day off or they take the afternoon off to come and show up for these protests because they're basically full-time activists paid for by grants from the taxpayer. Combine that with the lawsuits, the attorney's fees, Think about the um, public unions and the fact that they collect all these dues. You know, private unions had to fight, you know, tooth and nail, physically fight to get, you know, unionization and, and had to face strike breakers and all that. Public unions, it's all done for them. Uh, starting in the 60s when they were allowed to unionize, uh, you know, they have it in their contract that the the government collects these dues. So a, a union worker, a public union worker, doesn't ever see the union dues. It is taken out automatically by the government and placed into the account of the public sector unions to the tune, again, of tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, um, across the country, which, again, all of those union employees are ready-made activists. They're people to show up for protests. They are full-time activists paid for by the taxpayer again by taking a piece of all public employee union salaries. So in the end you have tens of thousands 
potentially hundreds of thousands of people, really there are millions, you know, there's well over a million people employed in one way or another in this capacity. If you include the public employee unions, it's millions, right? So it's an army of people. Now, most of the public employee employees have jobs, so I'll give you that. They can't always show up. But the union, you know, the people who actually represent them at the union are basically full-time activists. You have hundreds of thousands of people paid for by you, who are full-time activists, they are spending their time constantly advocating for the policies of the left. And we're paying for it. So when I say that you pay for 100% of the fight on your side and you pay for about 75% of the fight on the other side, it's true. It's true. Doris is just shaking her head. <laughs> Something that doesn't translate on radio. Well... We've had a number of terrorism attacks in the UK, right? There was one in Manchester, and then another one within a week at, on the London Bridge. And then uh, we even had a guy try to stab some police officers in front of the Notre Dame Cathedral in France, and they shot him dead. That was a guy that they uh, had given an award to earlier. For what? Something terrorism-related for fighting for a speech against terrorism. And they ended up having to shoot him dead this last week. The guy, one of the guys in the London bombing... Uh, his brother had been on the payroll of the government to run a program to, um, you know, fight extremism in the Muslim community. And his own brother shows up and is part of a, a terrorist attack. You know, my, my, my argument there would be that it's nearly impossible for law enforcement to be effective if leadership is required to believe things that aren't true or to ignore obvious realities. You know, if the truth is politically incorrect. If the truth is placed outside of the Overton window, then the problem can never be solved. Tell me again what the Overton window is. So the Overton window is the idea that there are certain things that it's okay to say and to talk about, and then there are other things that are not okay to talk about. You know, issues of race oftentimes are outside the Overton window. People will say they want to have a conversation about them, but if you actually talk about it, you get called a racist pretty quickly. And if you're being called a racist for bringing something up, it's outside the Overton window. I mean, if somebody's going to DEFCON 1 in a conversation, then that is clearly something that people believe is is something you don't talk about. Um, and when it comes to Europe and terrorism, you know, they have large Muslim populations, which is now a constituency, a voting constituency. So there are political realities there as well. But... You know, this constant drumbeat of saying that there's no connection between terrorism and Muslims or the Muslim religion is just a falsehood. I mean, it's a falsehood. Now, it's entirely, both things can be true, that the majority of Muslims, the vast majority of Muslims, will never be involved in a terrorist attack. True. But what are the percentages? Well, yes, of course. But it's also true that the terrorist attacks in which people are yelling Allah Akbar are coming from people who are Muslim adherents, right? I mean, if if a Christian was yelling, I do this in the name of Jesus, and then shooting up an abortion clinic, nobody would allow Christians to say, you know, there would be Christians who say that's not Christianity. And you could get away with it if it happened once. But if every two weeks somebody was yelling, you know, in the name of Jesus, I do this, and then killing a bunch of people, eventually folks would say, well, it looks like Christianity has a problem, you know, that something is going on in the religion that is... Fanatical. Is, you know, raising fanatics. Exactly right. Now, we've also seen surveys, though, in, in Europe that show that a large number of Muslims hold beliefs in Sharia law that aren't particularly modern or Western as far as women's rights and gay rights and the rest. They, um, when they're asked about whether or not they think terrorism is acceptable, it's interesting. It may be a very small percentage of, of Muslims in the Western world who would engage in terrorism, very small. But when you ask whether or not they think terrorism is acceptable, suddenly it becomes a number that's a little startling. It may still be low, but translates into a lot of people who have kind of mixed feelings about this or, or certainly don't condemn it. And then when you ask, would you report someone that you suspected well you know in europe sometimes this number is 30 to 40 percent that say they wouldn't 
That's scary. Now, that's a problem. Now, when, you know, when Trump was talking about stopping Muslim immigration for a, a period of time and people got, you know, l lost their minds over that, again, this is, and this is something that Ann Coulter talks about, w the percentages matter. You know, if one in 100 of the Muslims you admit are going to be a terrorist, that's a, you know, that's a big problem. If it's one in 10,000, that's still a problem. Even if it's one in 100,000, that still means that for every 100,000 Muslims you admit, one of them is going to conduct a terrorism attack, right? And 20 people are going to die. Well, some people would argue that that's not enough to offset the good of allowing that many people to have a chance at the American dream and to be refugees. Well, it's interesting. If we allowed 100,000 Christians from the Middle East to come in, the percentage is not there. We don't have to worry about one of them shooting up the Christmas party or going into the Orlando gay nightclub and killing 50 people. So, I mean, is there a dilution factor at some point? But... It's not one in 100,000, and we do have a problem with second gender. A lot, you know, a lot of these folks are saying, on the other side, are saying, well, a lot of them are American citizens, and they were born here, born to Muslim parents who were immigrants, and ultimately got radicalized. So what we know is, is that if you increase your Muslim population, some percentage is going to get radicalized by what's going on in the world. Okay, and it may be a very low percentage, but it still translates into actual human beings who conduct terrorism attacks. So, you know, maybe slowing the growth of your immigration, of your Muslim immigration population is a wise idea. Until such time as Muslim immigrants as a whole possess no more of a threat than any other religious group. We could let in 100,000 Sikhs and we're not going to face terrorist attacks from any of them. We can let in a hundred Buddh a hundred thousand Buddhists. So this isn't about, you know, protecting Christianity or that America is a Christian nation or this is just about the statistics and the reality of a particular group that has a problem. A problem that is not necessarily being dealt with. We have countries in the Middle East on both sides of the Shia Sunni divide who fuel and fund this kind of terrorism thinking they fund the madrasas and the and the clerics who advocate for very radical policies and that is a real issue i saw that uh, this week there was a federal prosecutor in michigan in a trial of a doctor who's been doing female genital mutilation admitting that maybe as many as a hundred girls have been subjected to this procedure in the United States. Right, so we have female genital mutilation going on in the United States. These young girls are deformed. They have been, have had an amputation conducted on them and it's permanent. This is not fixable, right? And this is a horrific crime and i guarantee you these are not the only 100 muslim girls that this has happened to in the united states because and this is basically kind of our version of the rotterdam scandal in in the uk where hundreds of girls were used in sex slavery essentially by a gang of muslim men and the authorities were slow to move on this because of the racial aspects of it because of the pc aspects of it they did not want to be accusing, you know, these protected groups. And again, unwilling to admit the truth of what was going on in front of them. And, um, you know, we have Muslims who are U.S. citizens. They enjoy the full rights of U.S. citizenship and the protections under the law that uh, everyone else does. But that also means that they are held as accountable as every other citizen, you know. No one I know could be involved in female genital mutilation and not face a long prison sentence. And if it were going on in the you know Russian Orthodox community, the FBI would have raided it by now. And we'd be talking about it. And the New York Times would be doing a front page story about this, uh, you know, horrible thing that Christians are doing to their little girls. But it's Muslims doing this to their little girls. And where is the New York Times? 
you know, they did like 19 front page stories to try to get women admitted to Augusta so that women could golf. And that was important to them and their feminist, you know, uh, crusade. But uh, where is their, where's their feminist crusade for these little Muslim girls that are being permanently injured in Michigan? You know, where's the New York Times on that? They'd rather close their eyes to things that um, don't hurt the Republican Party. Well, yeah, obviously at this point. So, we saw Wonder Woman. It was great. I loved it. You know, um, there's been this. What's interesting about it is, you know, there's, it's you know, Wonder Woman is such a great trolling figure. I mean, I don't think anybody who created her thought about that at the time but she is in modern politics just a natural trolling figure because she's a beautiful athletic woman who um you know is a superhero but she's also extremely sexy and the whole feminist cottage industry cannot figure out whether they want to like or hate this movie because, of course, she's kick-ass, you know, and she's taking on the bad guys, and she's totally self-sufficient. So there are these certain things they're drawn to about her. But, you know, I saw someone write the other day that, when are we going to get a fat, ugly Wonder Woman? And I'm thinking, never. Not only does no one want that, and is that just a horrible idea, but uh, you're if you think Hollywood's on your side, I mean, feminists need to understand that, that the... At the end of the day, Hollywood wants to make money. Well, we're, <laughs> we're not going to get any fat, ugly superhero men either. You, well, you might. I mean, you do. I mean, I, you get some ugly characters. You know, I'm. I, you know, there are Hellboy and some things like that that are not particularly attractive. Um, so I, I mean, I, I probably disagree with you. I mean, I think Hollywood will do that with men, but. Uh, the idea that, you know, these movies, you know, part of the, what, this is one of the wonderful things about watching leftists get themselves tied up in knots. So Hollywood is part of the liberal commanding heights. And Hollywood will fund these sort of small $20 million budget anti-war movies and things, that, these sort of one-offs that are, they know are going to be a failure and no one's going to see them, but they have to do it for their politics. They're not going to spend $250 million dollars on a tentpole movie that is some kind of a PC, you know, jihad movie. They're not going to do that. It's too much money, too much money. And those mo movies have to be marketed internationally in order to make their money back. And so Hollywood has this new reality, right? I mean, there's a new movie screen being built in China every week, and China is an exploding movie market for them. That's why you'll notice in Hollywood movies, the big tent movies, there's always a Chinese connection or a Chinese reference in any tent pole movie that Hollywood puts out. It's either, you know, uh, the Transformers are destroying a bunch of cities and Hong Kong will always be one of them. Or there's a Chinese actor or actress who will be one of the X-Men, you know, or, the, you know, there'll be some connection in, um, in the movie Interstellar right, when they needed uh, help from another country to uh, to get some rendezvous, some material with a with a space station. It was the Chinese who came to the rescue, right? I mean, they could have picked any country, but they picked the Chinese. This is done on purpose. And it's actually kind of a find Alfred Hitchcock in his movies uh, fun game. Anytime you go to a tentpole movie, look for the Chinese connection because there will always be one of some kind or another. And it's just kind of fun to find. And it's for the Chinese audiences. And by the way, they get the joke. Um, I follow, I have some friends in China who I follow on WeChat and they find that immediately too. They're always looking for the Chinese connection in these superhero movies and they'll laugh about it because to them it feels like a token as well, like some kind of thing that's just sort of put in there to make them happy. But uh, the larger point I was making was that that you know the Chinese are not particularly socially liberal. Uh, most of them are married and have one or two children, and they're still pretty conservative, you know, in relation to the United States of America when it comes to social issues. And a lot of other places that Hollywood movies go to also face that same reality. So when they make these two hundred and fifty million dollar movies half, at least half of the ticket sales are going to be outside the United States. They are not going to put in these extreme PC feminist warrior BS stuff and destroy the chances that these movies are going to make the money back. 
and a prophet. So, you know, when they're making Wonder Woman, there are some subtle things in there, some sort of pro-feminist things in there. But she's also sexy, and she has a romantic relationship with a man, and, you know, she's very feminine. And I guarantee you that in the discussions, you know, when this movie was being written in the early stages, that stuff needed to be in there. It had to be in there to please the audiences, you know, half of the audience in the United States and pretty much 95% of the audience everywhere else. So didn't I see Steve Mnuchin's name when they were running the credits? Doris caught that. I pointed out when we saw the... um, the King Arthur movie that his name was on that. You know, he is the Treasury Secretary now, but movies take about two to three years from initial pitch to ultimate release. And so he still has movies in the can that are sort of making their way through the process and being slowly released on the screen. So you if you look, you can still see Steve Mnuchin movies that he's an executive producer on. And King Arthur was one of them. I actually think that a lot of the negative press about that movie was designed to hurt him. Uh, and, you know, his ability to make any money back on that. Uh, I assume all of his money's in a trust, so he doesn't have any connection to it. But um, I actually thought King Arthur was better than the critics said it was. It was a fine movie. It was a good escapism. It wasn't a bad movie at all. It was totally enjoyable. If, you know, you know what you're getting, it's not going to be deep intellectual stuff. It was a fun action movie, and I thought it delivered. And the graphics were great. And, um, and the actors did a good job. Yeah, totally, totally. I would totally recommend that movie on the big screen. Uh, one, uh, Wonder Woman also had, had Steve Mnuchin's name on it. So Doris and I are looking for that now when we, uh, when we watch the end credits. But good for him. I mean, these movies are all making money. And uh, that's great. I mean, they're... Wonder Woman was... I, you know, I happen to be kind of more of a fan of the DC stuff than the Marvel. You know, the X-Men and other stuff that, had, you know, that is... Um, I didn't particularly like the last Wolverine movie that came out at all. Um, there's a I have followed, you know, there. <laughs> D, the Warner Brothers has an animation department, and they've put out an animated version of these DC heroes: Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, the the Justice League. They've done probably ten or fifteen of these movies over the last decade, decade and a half, and I've seen a lot of them, and they're pretty good. I mean, I like them, and um, but they have a kind of a dark tone to them. And I'm not sure that everybody who is seeing these movies now, the the live action ones, has seen the animated ones. And maybe some people don't particularly like seeing kind of a darker version of Superman or a, a much darker version of Batman than the Timothy Nolan versions. But uh, that's certainly where the comics have been for some time, and it's where the earlier animated stuff has been. And so I'm, I guess, I'm a little bit more predisposed to it. I'm open to it, and I, I like it. I, I've I've liked all of the DC stuff that's come out so far. The Man of Steel, and yes, I I'm one of the few people that like Batman versus Superman. I think that um, um, Ben Affleck, who's not a great actor, he's a good actor. He's not a great actor, but he's one of those actors that's sort of you know it's important what you cast him in. You know, he was good in The Accountant. Excellent. Yeah, uh, but he's terrible in other movies. And it's because he has a limited skill set, and you need to put him in the right thing. But he can deliver in the right movie. You know, as Doris said, I thought The Accountant was a good movie. And he, you know, Batman doesn't say a lot, and he kind of broods, and he has sort of a, uh, this, you know, Affleck has the perfect jawline for yes. uh, Batman. And so he, it works. I think it, it totally works. He fought, you know, a lot of people made a big deal of when he was fighting for that part, and, uh, you know, made fun of him, but, um, you know, he's come through on that. I think he's delivered, and I, I like those movies. The, I encourage you to see the Wonder Woman movie. I thought it was pretty good. Had a little bit of a theme, anti-war theme, but they didn't get carried away with it. Doris and I have talked about this before. You know, I, I just kind of laugh. You know, there's a difference between a movie that is just entirely a, uh, you know, PC pile of you know, yes. and you have to ignore it. And then, you know, there's the typical Hollywood movie is going to have some sort of leftist viewpoints. That's almost unavoidable because to a person, Hollywood writers are some of the most left of center people you're ever going to meet. They, I mean, 
uh, Aaron Sorkin's even admitted that they're basically communists. I mean, as far as, and, you know, <laughs> it was the Writers Guild that was communist infiltrated back during the, you know, the 40s and 50s anyway. So, I mean, of all of the different guilds and unions in Hollywood, the writers are the most left-leaning. And they have, you know, they write the words, they write the plots, so they have real influence and control, usually trying to be subtle in how they insert it. As the years have gone on, they've gotten less subtle, and as Trump derangement syndrome sets in, you know, it becomes, um, you know, somebody at the executive producer level has to put some checks on them, I'm sure, constantly saying, that's out, we have to market this in China, thank you. Um, but, you know, when it comes to movies like Wonder Woman that has a little bit of a theme of, of, of anti-war, you know, they still end up having to wage war to defeat war, right? So uh, this idea that passivism is the answer, e not even Wonder Woman believes that because obviously she's kick-ass and she's out there taking names and, and ultimately killing people if necessary. Star Trek was famous for this, you know. Uh, the producers would brag about how they'd created this future where mankind had come together. and Well, had they? I mean, if you actually look at the plots of the Star Trek television show and the movies, first of all, passivism would be boring it's kind of hard to write hour-long plots if everybody's just getting along and loves each other. So, I mean, friction and tension is necessary to make plot devices. But second of all, that's not the world that Star Trek exi you know, in inhibit. It's, I mean, uh, look at the... Uh, they're at war with the Klingons. They're at war with the Romulans. There are all sorts of people within, you know, the crew members who go rogue people who make uh, selfish decisions that l lead to death and destruction. Uh, so this idea that this is some peaceful, pacifist future world is just BS. They can claim that all they want, but the plots are the exact opposite. They love to claim, every now and again, some character in a Star Trek show will claim that, oh, you know, we did away with money a long time ago. And then two episodes later, they'll be using credits to try to buy something. You know, I mean, the idea that they aren't trading and that ultimately there isn't some value put on the work that people are doing. I mean, I think what's suggested in Star Trek is that the Federation is kind of a NASA. And so in some ways, they're sort of employees of a, a government entity. It may be a, a world government entity. So, I mean, maybe they're donating their time, but ultimately, do they retire? And if they retire, how do they live if someone isn't supplying them with a home and food and all of that. Everyone else outside of the Federation appears to be actually involved in commerce in one way or another. You know, whether they're colonists or traders or what have you, everyone else is having to make a living. So again, they love to claim that, you know, all of these leftist utopian ideals have been achieved in their shows, but that's that's just not there in the plot. It's just not there in the plot at all. So I just kind of laugh it off. And so there are some um, anti-war themes. Well, some of it is uh, just like this Christian idea of you know the fallen man that we are, that we are not perfect and we have we're influenced by the devil and and uh, and you know there is no achieving utopia on this earth, which is kind of a core Christian tenet. That you know that's right there too. I mean, a lot of these movies have to kind of you know while they want to push a. Um, pacifist theme, they they so dilute it or they have to obfuscate the point or broaden it to such an extent that various religions can see their own beliefs in the plot that's that line. And it's very easy to watch the Wonder Woman movie and see this as, you know, a, a fight between her and Satan, essentially, instead of Ares, the uh, god of war, and that it's Satan that's influencing people to be warlike, and that uh, when she makes the point that man is flawed, well, you know, Christians understand that inherently. So, at the end of the day, that stuff is kind of minor, and that, uh, you know, there have been some complaints that there's not enough action, but I actually, you know, I like origin stories, and usually the first movie uh, around a superhero, the sort of origin story, is not quite as action-filled, because you need to tell the backstory of who the superhero is, and why they are the way they are, and that was actually the best part of the movie, I thought. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big fan of, A, extended action scenes that go on for, you know, 10 minutes or 5 minutes. Those are obnoxious. Plus, the way most of these action scenes are done today, they're so quickly edited that you can't even tell who's hitting who or what's going on, and I mostly find myself checking out and just waiting for it to be over. Because we all know who's going to win that fight anyway. 
it's all you know i mean most of these movies are sort of pre-programmed in that way so i like i like the I like the plot and the dialogue more than the action because the action doesn't tend to be particularly surprising. Although the one thing that can be fun is the, just the graphics. Sometimes just the element of what they've created, an entire city being de destroyed or something, that can be enjoyable just because it's impressive uh, you know, how well they've, they've carried it off because it's entirely fictional. I mean, it was all just done with, with you know, green screen and computer graphics and the rest. Um, but... Yeah, no, I, I, I thought that uh, it was a very watchable movie, very enjoyable. The other thing I always, you know, am hopeful that is that they'll surprise me. Even in the sort of tentpole movies that are pre-programmed, I'd like to be surprised, you know. Don't do it exactly as, you know, your audience expects it to happen. And I thought there were a few, a, few, a couple of good surprises in the movie that were good and, you know, helping, help to deepen the plot. So we enjoyed Wonder Woman. We probably talked too much about it, but it gave us a chance to talk about some of the PC crap that gets inserted into movies. By the way, that's everywhere. I mean, my, uh, you know, Hollywood and the liberal commanding heights is currently on a trans jihad. You know, they, they want to talk about transgender. This is apparently the most important issue in the world. Uh, but, of course, that creates everybody in Hollywood trying to find some way to get on the trans bandwagon, right? So nearly every show has a plot about a transgender issue or they've inserted a transgender character into the show. A most absurd one I saw recently was this Showtime show Billions, which is actually a pretty good show with Paul Giamatti. Uh, and just suddenly this season they have a, you know, the, uh, the, the, the uh, finance company has added a transgender employee for no other reason, for no other reason than to simply have a transgender character in the show. And, you know, at this point, you know, I just roll my eyes. It's just so silly. I, I've actually come to believe that there may be more transgender characters in all of the current Hollywood TV shows and movies than there are actual transgender people in the United States. I, well, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> so that's mildly amusing because we have to laugh. So we've, uh, we're just about done with our hour here. Again, I want to thank all the gabbers who are listening and to everyone else who's found the show. Uh, again, we're on Stitcher and we're on SoundCloud. I'm going to wait until we have maybe three shows before I go out and put us on Apple iTunes. But if you're listening to the show, I hope that you'll give us a good review if you like the show and that you will share us with others to help us grow the audience. And again, you are not alone there are more of us than there are of them. They just happen to occupy the commanding heights in our society. And if we band together and if we fight hard enough, we will defeat them. So we'll see you next week. And thank you again for listening. Goodbye, Doris. Goodbye.